Greetings to all of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from Avelikira Brethren Assembly, my family, and also from Brethren Bible Institute, Patanandita. I thank the Lord for bringing all of us together in His presence to f- spend a few days to have a time of Bible study and a time of fellowship. Let us be found in the presence of the Lord uh, with a desire to know the will of God for our lives. Let us turn in our Bibles to Psalm 23, uh, verses 1 and 4. Psalm 23, verses 1 and 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Even when I must walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff reassure me. So we experience the shepherding ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. When he was here on the face of the earth, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And also we know that he is our great shepherd, the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest for us in the presence of the Lord, is our great shepherd, Therefore, we can join with David and say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we know that he is our chief shepherd, he is going to come and he is going to give us rewards. God willing, on Sunday, Dr. Alexander Quirion will be explaining more about this in his final session. The rod and staff are the shepherd's equipment to protect the sheep when they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So David, when he was meditating the care of God, he was comforted by the fact that he receives the protection from the Lord and always he enjoys the presence of God with him. And when we are living as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the shepherd. He is always caring for each one of us. And because of the continuous ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that our salvation is secure. We know once a sinner is saved, he is saved forever. There is no losing of one's salvation. Now, this is one of the doctrines we emphasize or we have learned as a result of studying the word of God. If you just analyze other denominations, we find that apart from the brethren, the local churches and the Baptist group, and I think some Bible churches, all other denominations, they deny the doctrine of the eternal security of our salvation. So we emphasize this in our teaching. And we have so many evidences, references in the scriptures to prove that our salvation is secure. And we know that our salvation is secure because of the works of the triune God. And when we read John's Gospel, chapter 10, 29, we read, The statement of Jesus, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them from my father's hand. So we are in the hands of the heavenly father. So that is the comfort, that is an assurance for us that we are safe and secure. And Jesus himself said in verse 28, John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hands. So we are not only in the hands of the Father, 
But Jesus said, we are in his hand. So that also talks about the security we enjoy. We are familiar with John chapter 3, 16. God saw the, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. So the life we received, it is not a losing life. It is very clear from the word we have received the eternal life. And also our salvation is secure because of the work of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 we read, When you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So the very moment we were saved, now we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So that sealing is an assurance that our body will be saved or we will be glorified at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we believe in the doctrine of the eternal security of salvation. But many times in my ministry, in my experience, I have found that our people, they take this doctrine as a license to commit sin. Once there was a conference, a seminar held at Kumbhanat. There was an issue you know, among the brethren after JC, they left the brethren assembly and went to Pentecostal uh, church. So Atma Pragasini that time conducted a seminar at Kumbhanat. I presented a paper on uh, spiritual gifts. So my point was, you know, our salvation is secure. The salvation which we received as a result of grace of God is secure. So also the spiritual gifts or the grace gifts are secure. Even if a believer commits sin, and my point was he is not going to lose the spiritual gifts he has received. So after the Presentation was over, you know, we had a discussion. So a brother who attended that discussion, and he said that, brother, you don't teach this to the common believers. So a Pentecostal man attended that meeting that time. Now he is a member of Kumbhanat Brethren Assembly. So he said, brother, you don't teach this doctrine. If you teach the doctrine that the spiritual gifts will not be loosed, our pastors will take that as a license to commit sin. Now I have read you know, a few books dealing with the eternal security of salvation. And I found that some others who believe this doctrine, they say that this is not to be taught to the common people in the assembly because now they will take that as a license to commit sin. So many of our people, because you know, we teach this in Sunday school, I think in Brother and Sunday School textbook in lesson uh, standard five, we teach this. So many of our people, they know that I am saved. My salvation is secure. So anyway, one day I will reach the other shore. So many people, you know, they take this as a license to commit sin. But along with that, whenever I teach the doctrine of the eternal security of salvation, I teach that, brethren, there are, you know, consequences for a believer's sin. So in this session, what I would like to do is to draw your attention to some of the consequences a believer would experience as a result of committing sin. First of all, a believer, when a believer commits sin, he loses his confidence to come into the presence of the Lord. Let us see Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Every day, the Lord Almighty, he comes to the garden. Adam and Eve you know, join with God in the evening walking. So they experience that kind of you know, real time with the Lord. But when they committed sin, you know, when they had taken the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we find that when the Lord came, he did not see them. So he you know, called you know, Adam and said, where are you? So what was the answer? I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So when Adam and Eve committed sin, you know, they lost their confidence to come into the presence of the Lord. So many times, you know, this, this is what happening in many of the believers. Now, when they commit sin, you know, they are afraid of coming to the assembly. They don't want to face the elders of the assembly. They don't want to see the face of the believers. Now, by fearing that, you know, if they ask me something about the sin I committed, you know, what would I say? You know, what would be their reaction? You know, will they, you know, excommunicate me from the assembly? When they publicly call me in the assembly? You know, because of many reasons, you know, many people, when they commit sin, you know, they uh, stop coming to the assembly. So when a believer commits sin, he loses his confidence to come into the presence of the Lord. Now many times, you know, we, you know, for, a, for the sake of a company, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now for the sake of a company or friendship, we see our people, they start smoking. You know, use drugs or, you know, use liquors. But when they realize that, you know, that is a sin or that is a mistake, you know, they are in a situation in which they are not able to, you know, come back. Now, often when we preach the gospel in Kerala, we used to give an illustration. You know, during the flood season, in the Aramula, Aramula, Aratabuda, Putangao area of you know, Kerala, the young people in you know, those days, maybe 50, 60 years before, you know, they used to wait you know, for the things you know, coming through the water. So they used to get you know, the, the wood. Sometimes you know, they get the, the, the household materials. So one day, the young people, they were eagerly waiting for the things to collect during a flood season. Now one young man, he saw, you know, something, you know, like, you know, a blanket. So he thought that that is a blanket. So he just, you know, jumped into the water and he tried to get that. So when the friends, when they were, you know, seeing that, they understood that, you know, it was a bear and, you know, it is, you know, taking him to the water. So they said, no, friend, no, you just leave it and come. Then they heard the last, you know, sound of that, you know, friend, I already left it. It is taking me to the deep waters. Now, many times, you know, that is the situation in which many of our young people are in. Or sometimes the elderly people are in. So we have to be very serious about sin. So when we commit sin, you know, it takes us away from the presence of the Lord. So let us examine ourselves and let us confess our sin in the presence of the Lord and let us be right with the Lord. 
secondly when a believer commits sin he cannot be filled with the holy spirit in the book of judges you know in chapter 16 verse 19 we read like this she made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair then she began to afflict him and his strength left him so here we find a man a nazarite a person set apart for the lord and his work that he associated with the lady with whom he should not associate he reveal his uh, secret we find that he lost his strength so let me say that when a believer commits sin he cannot be filled with the holy spirit we are familiar with ephesians 5:18 there we read do not get drunk with wine for that is dissipation but be filled with the spirit now that is the only one positive commandment we see in the scriptures in relation to the present day believers so all the believers are commanded to be filled with the holy spirit filling with the holy spirit means and we are commanded to be controlled by the holy spirit so when we leave us believers we need strength from the lord we need power from the lord and we receive that power through the holy spirit so samson he committed sin in the presence of the lord he lost his strength so let me remind all of you that when a believer commits sin in that situation that believer cannot be filled with the spirit when a believer commits sin in that situation that believer cannot be controlled with the holy spirit in that situation we cannot receive the strength from the holy spirit when we read ephesians first corinthians chapter 2 and 3 now we come across three types of people the natural man when we find carnal man in chapter 2 chapter 3 then in chapter 2 that i think 15 we find about the spiritual man so when i study this i make an observation natural man is an unbeliever because he is an unbeliever he does not have the holy spirit carnal man is a person who is born of the spirit and he has the holy spirit but he is not obeying the holy spirit and the spiritual man now he is the one who is always being filled with the spirit and it is the commandment we see here in ephesians to the ephesian believers be filled with the spirit I think recently some of you might have heard this same statement from me now many times we we think that you know the filling with the holy spirit is something that is necessary only for certain ministry that is why before the preacher comes and preach the message people pray lord you fill thy servant with the spirit often we hear before the solemnization of a marriage lord thy servant is going to solemnize the marriage you fill him with the spirit lord thy servant is going to preach a gospel message you fill him with thy spirit so we have a wrong idea that the filling with the holy spirit is something that is only necessary for doing certain ministry but what is the commandment we hear now paul was commanding the ephesian believers that they should be filled with the holy spirit if you rightly translate that from the bible from the greek it is constantly be filled with the spirit or continue to be filled with the spirit so the natural man is an unbeliever he is not having the holy spirit carnal man is born of the spirit but he is not obeying the spirit 
But the spiritual man is the one who is always being filled with the Spirit. So when a believer commits sin, in that situation, that believer cannot be filled with the Spirit. Let us examine ourselves. When we are in the presence of the Lord, let us just examine our words. Let us examine the lifestyle in which we are in. Let us examine our interpersonal relationship. Are we right in the presence of the Lord? If we are not right in the presence of the Lord, in that situation we cannot be filled with the Spirit. So when a believer commits sin, he loses his confidence to come into the presence of the Lord. When a believer commits sin, in that situation he cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, when a believer commits sin, he experiences bitterness from the Lord. Let us read Ruth chapter 1, 19 to 21. Ruth. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? You know, Elimelech, Naomi, Mahlon, and Kilion. As a family from Bethlehem, they went to Moab. And now, you know, Naomi is coming back. See, from God's presence, she went away, you know, into a group of people with whom they should not associate. And as a result of that, we find she, Naomi lost her husband. She lost you know, her son, Mahlon, then Kilion, and one you know, daughter-in-law. Now she's coming with Ruth. And the people, when they saw, they said, is this Naomi? So what was the response of her? She said, do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara. You know the meaning of Naomi? The meaning of Naomi is the blessed one. So she said, don't call me blessed one. Call me Mara. You know, bitter. And she said, the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. So because she went away from the presence of the Lord, she lost her husband. She lost her children. She lost everything. And now she is coming back and she says that, do not call me the blessed one. My dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, when we commit sin, now we have to go through the bitter experiences. Now many times you think that, why, Lord, this is happening to me? There's so many things, you know, happening in my life or in my family, in my profession, in my children's life. When we examine, we may find that that may be because of the sin. When a believer commits sin, he may experience bitterness from the Lord. Fourthly, Psalm 51 verse 12, that is a familiar passage. There, David Praise to God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So when a believer commits sin, he loses the joy of salvation. David committed sin. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He was behind the murder. So the Lord sent the prophet and said, you are that man. So he's praying in the presence of the Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. It is not 
that you know losing of salvation here but he is praying for the joy of salvation now, when a sinner is saved we know you know there is much joy in heaven when a sinner is saved there is much joy among the angels in acts chapter 16 we read when the philippian jailer and his family you know when they were saved they experienced this joy in their family in acts chapter 8 we find eunuch you know when he was saved and baptized you know he went you know with rejoicing so we as a result of our faith in the lord jesus christ you know as a result of this salvation we have you know experiencing joy in our lives and when we commit sin you know this verse psalm 51:12 you know, and makes it clear that you know we will lose the joy of our salvation david lost that so let us examine ourselves and let us leave in accordance with the word of god fifthly when a believer commits sin he loses his fellowship with the triune god and also his fellowship with the fellow believers in the assembly when we read first john 17 and john says but if he walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another If you walk in the light we have fellowship with one another in verse 3 he says indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ and we are familiar with the last verse in the Corinthian epistles there Paul says the grace of the lord Jesus Christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all so we experience the fellowship with the triune god we have fellowship with god the father god the son and the holy spirit at the same time we experience the fellowship with the fellow believers who are coming in the assembly so we have a vertical fellowship with triune god and a horizontal fellowship with the fellow believers but when we commit sin what will happen we will lose the fellowship with god as well as we will lose the fellowship with the fellow believers in the assembly now when the assembly comes to know that a person is committing sin if that is very clear to the elders of the assembly we know that they take a discipline reaction they keep a brother or sister an erring brother or sister you know by following the biblical principles biblical mothers you know they keep away from the assembly and when the elders you know do that other believers you know they don't have any right to question that it is the part of the ministry of the elders so we lose the believers when they commit sin they lose the fellowship with god and also with the fellow believers once i heard a missionary story like this a missionary he was working in a foreign land So as a result of his work so many the criminals they heard the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and an assembly testimony was established in that area but some people you know they did not like that because many people are avoiding you know the the liquor the drinks you know they don't have any sale their income is coming down so they try to threaten the missionary you know they did so many things but yet in the difficult situation that missionary continued his missionary work 
So one day, you know, this gang, they joined together and said, this night, let us go and kill that missionary. He should not be here in our country. So they plan everything and at night, they were going with all kinds of you know, weapons to kill him. They thought that the missionary may be sleeping. You know, we can easily go and kill that man. But from the far, you know, they saw light in missionary's house. You know, they're just scared, but you know, the leader said, let us go. As they were moving towards the assembly hall where the missionary was staying, you know, they could see about 12 people you know, just you know, going around that assembly hall. So they were afraid of that scene and they just ran away from that place. And one man from that group, you know, he got up early in the morning and he came to the missionary and said, this is what happened last night. Then the missionary said, brother, that time I was praying for you all. I was praying for your conversion. Then you, know, you might have seen the angels you know, sent by God to protect me here. Then he shared the gospel to that man. And that man was saved. After a few weeks, this missionary went to his home assembly and he shared this incident, the wonderful way in which God protected him. He explained everything. And after he gave thanks, you know, he, when he was about to sit, one of the elders, you know, he stood and asked him, can you repeat can you tell the date and the time once again? Then that brother, you know, mentioned the date and the time in which, you know, that incident took place. You know, that elder, you know, with emotion, he said, Brother, that day, that particular time, we 12 elders of this assembly, we, are, we were kneeling down here in this assembly and we were praying for you. Dear brethren, when we are right with the Lord, when we enjoy the fellowship of the triune God, now we have the almighty God to protect us from all the dangers. And when we, you know, maintain our fellowship with the assembly, you now we have the brothers and sisters in our assembly to remember us, you know, in prayers. What a wonderful care we experience from the triune God and from the fellow brethren. But when a believer commits sin, you know, he loses his fellowship with the triune God and with the assembly. Sixthly, when a believer commits sin, he grieves the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we read, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How many times the Pentecostal people, they say that when the brother and people you know, criticize the Pentecostal saying that the gift of tongues is not there. They say we are grieving the Holy Spirit. When we say that the gift of prophecy is not there today, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. When we say that it is not necessary for a believer to wait for the anointing with the Holy Spirit, they say we are grieving the Holy Spirit. When we say that it is not necessary that the believer should wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they say we are grieving the Holy Spirit. But when we study the context, you know, that is not the context at all. I, I don't have time to go in details. If you read Ephesians chapter 4, 25 onwards, it is very clear. When a believer tells a lie, he is grieving the Holy Spirit. When a believer, you know, gets angry and that anger, you know, is leading him to commit sin, he is grieving the Holy Spirit. When a believer continues in that anger, he is grieving the Holy Spirit. 
when a believer does not work and live you know he is grieving the holy spirit when a believer does not do faithfulness in his responsibility he is grieving the holy spirit when a believer you know uses you know bad words he is grieving the holy spirit with our words when we you know hurt the people when our words do not bring edification we are grieving the holy spirit so paul says do not grieve the holy spirit so when a believer lives in any of the mentioned situation it is very clear that in that situation we grieve the holy spirit so that is another you know consequence of a believer's a sin and finally when a believer commits sin he experiences the chastisement from the lord always you know every sunday we read first corinthians 11:27 to 32 therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord but a man must examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment himself if he does not get the body rightly for this reason many among you are weak and sick and number a number sleep but if we judged ourselves rightly we would not be judged but when we are judged we are disciplined by the lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world so this passage makes it clear that when a believer commits sin he experiences the chastisement from the lord now we from our you know when we just go back to our childhood days we know our parents especially you know our fathers you know they punished us so whenever they saw a mistake in us they used to punish us so just like that kind of punishment we experience from our human fathers now we have a heavenly father in heaven Now we experience that kind of chastisement from the Lord. Bible says that when we are there in the presence of the Lord to take part of the Lord's supper, we have to examine ourselves. And then we have to take part of the Lord's supper, the bread and the wine. But many times what do we do? Instead of looking within now we look front is she eligible we look left and right and back is she eligible and many times we don't you know examine ourselves and paul says because of this reason many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep and also when we are in the presence of the lord to take part of the lord's supper we have to meditate on the crucifixion of our lord jesus christ we have to meditate the sufferings the agony the pain our lord experienced but many times we don't do that and for that also this punishment you know will come once i heard that in a in an assembly in gulf when the lord's supper the bread was you know distributed a brother was sleeping then the next brother he just you know woke him up and said you know appam the bread then he you know got up from the sleep and said you know morning i had you know puttu at home you know and in one assembly in kerala during the the wine distribution time it was distributed in a glass when amachu was sleeping the sister who was sitting next to her just woke her up and gave her the glass and she took a 10 rupee note and put into the wine in that assembly the offering was collected they used to collect in the glass now many times when we are in the presence of the lord we are not serious sometimes we think about a brother or sister you know sitting nearby us is she eligible is she eligible 
So when a believer you know, commits sin, when a believer you know, does not ex examine himself or herself, you know, we have this punishment. Many are weak, many are sick, and you know, sudden death happened in the Corinthian assembly. Now, by God's grace, you know, we are surviving. If the Lord would deal with the assembly as he dealt with you know, Ananias and Sapphira or as he dealt in the early church, how many of you, how many of us you know, would be here? So let us examine ourselves when we are in the presence of the Lord to take part of the Lord's Supper. Let us, let us, take part of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. When a believer commits sin, he experiences the chastisement from the Lord. So we believe in the doctrine of eternal security of our salvation. At the same time, we should remember that when we live as believers here on the face of the earth, not after the death, but when we live here on the face of the earth, we have to reap the consequences of our sins. So we have seen that when a believer commits sin, he loses his confidence to come into the presence of the Lord. He cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit. He cannot experience, the, he experiences the bitterness from the Lord. He loses the joy of salvation. He loses his fellowship. That he had with the triune God and with the assembly. He grieves the Holy Spirit. And finally, he experiences the chastisement from the Lord. My dear friends, brothers and sisters, how is our personal life? Are we living a holy life in his presence? Our Lord said, be ye holy because I am holy. So when we are in the presence of the Lord, when we attend this IBF conference, it is good that we can see so many of our friends, relatives. But take this moment to examine ourselves. Am I right in the presence of the Lord? Am I living a holy life in his presence? In the Bible we read, for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So when we commit sin, now he is there to punish us. So do not fall in the hand of a jealous God. So how is our interpersonal relationship? How do you deal with your brother or sister? If you are not right with your brother or sister, confess your sin and be right with your brother or sister. Next time, before you take part of the Lord's Supper, be right with your brother or sister. And ask forgiveness from the Lord. And if you have done something to a person, and if he or she does not know that, no need to go and tell and make another problem, but reveal that, tell that to the Lord and ask for the forgiveness. But if you have done something to a brother or sister, and if that person is well aware of that, it is necessary that you know, we should go and confess that sin to them and ask you know, pardon for that mistake you have committed. And if you have done some mistake, if you have any problem with the local assembly, it is your responsibility that you have to go and write be right with that assembly. So when we are in the presence of the Lord, let us you now examine ourselves. Now confess our sins in the presence of the Lord. In John's epistle, 1 John 1, 9, we read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins in his presence. Let us be right with God and let us be right with the brethren, the brothers and sisters. 
and let us live a victorious life. May God's name be glorified.